Chandrasekhar was one of the greatest astrophysicists in the 1900s, and he made plenty of discoveries, but today I'll be focusing on the Chandrasekhar limit, because it became the source of one of the greatest betrayals in the field of physics. Subramanian Chandrasekhar was born in 1910. His mother was an intellectual, and his uncle, Sir Chandrasekhar, actually won a Nobel Prize in 1930. He ended up going to the University of Madras and then went to Trinity College, where he became a staff member. He says that, After the early preparatory years, my scientific work has followed a certain pattern motivated principally by a quest after perspectives. So Chandrasekhar began to apply Einstein's theory of special relativity to stars, and I'm going to go over a really basic understanding that gets through three points about Einstein's theory of special relativity, but if you'd like to learn more about it, I've left some resources in the description. So basically, Einstein's theory of special relativity postulates that as an object reaches the speed of light, its mass reaches infinity, and to move an infinite amount of mass, you need an infinite amount of energy, but that's not possible so it cannot bypass the speed of light. And this basically implies a universal speed limit for all the objects in our universe. And that speed limit is the speed of light. And this kind of brings us to E equals MC squared, right? And that stands for energy equals mass times the speed of light squared. And it shows this re relationship between energy and mass and how they can kind of be interchanged. But in a way, it, it's more than just an interchange between the mass and the energy, because the mass is being multiplied by the speed of light, which is squared. And the speed of light is already, you know, massive number, of course. And so we've got the mass times the speed of light. That gives you a massive output. So, you know, theoretically, you could get a lot of energy out of just a little mass. Another important thing about relativity is, well, relativity, right? Let's say you had a beam of light moving in a direction. Of course, that beam of light is moving at the speed of light. And Usain Bolt also moving in the same direction as the beam of light, but at the speed of light as well. If Usain Bolt were to look over his shoulder and look at the beam of light, it would have looked as if it was frozen in time, as if it was not moving at all. But if you had an outside observer who wasn't moving, who were to record the speed of that beam of light, the recording he would get would be that the speed of the beam was the speed of light. And so speed is relative to the observer. It's about the perspective of the observer. And an important thing to keep in mind is that neither of them are wrong. Relative to Usain Bolt, the beam of light isn't moving. Relative to the observer, the beam of light is moving. To put it in perspective, you could kind of talk about a car on the highway moving at 70 miles an hour. Let's say you're in your car next to it, also moving at 70 miles an hour. If you look over, the driver in the car doesn't look like he's moving at all. But if you were on the side of the highway, you would see that driver zoom by. And so it's important to keep in mind that, you know, it's speed and time is relative to the observer. And that's how time dilation happens and how time can move slower depending on the speed someone is going. The reason the theory of special relativity applies here is because particles in stars are moving close to the speed of light. At the time in the 1930s, collapsing stars were understood to be white dwarfs, right? That is, after turning all their hydrogen into helium, losing all this energy, they would shrink and condense from their own gravity. But Chandra Shakar realized that stars could collapse in other ways. He discovered the Chandra Shakar limit. That is to say that a white dwarf could only have so much mass. If a white star had more mass than 1.4 times the mass of the sun, it would just continue to collapse until it blew up in a supernova, creating a neutron star. And he also discovered that a star with even more mass than that, massive amount of mass, would then collapse even more and collapse into a black hole. And this helped us understand supernovas, neutron stars, and black holes, and all that stuff. And Chandra discovered that black holes were between time and space, a place where nothing can es escape, not light can escape. And this was the first ever proof of black holes. At the time, India was still under British rule, and Chandra Shakar's uncle was the only Indian to have won a Nobel Prize. And so, Chandra went to Cambridge to let his discovery be known, and he was completely discovered. 
Even though he was put down, he still continued to finish his doctorate, and in 1933, he earned a fellowship at Cambridge, where he met Sir Arthur Stanley Eddington, another astrophysicist who was incredibly famous at the time for bringing Einstein's theory of relativity to the English-speaking world. In 1935, Eddington suggested that Chandra should present his theory to the Royal Astronomical Society in London. The day before the presentation, Chandra learned that Eddington was presenting on the exact same topic as him. He thought this was weird, but paid no mind. And so, the day of the presentation, Chandra goes up and shows a graph showing that a star can only have so much mass before it collapses into a black hole. And after he presented his theory, Eddington went up and destroyed his theory, saying that a huge star can't just disappear into nothing. But Eddington had no proof. Despite this, Chandra was still defamed. Worried that his work would never be taken seriously again, he moved into other fields. He left Cambridge where his life and career had, he felt, been blighted by racism and took a post at the University of Chicago where he was to stay for the rest of his life. In 1972, scientists detected a black hole trillions of miles away from the earth. And Chandra was finally proven right 40 years after his discovery and in 1983 he won the nobel prize and even though the betrayal of eddington weighed on him until his death in 1955 he is known as one of the greatest astrophysicists to us today i was curious what would happen if that was applied to stars and i found this limit but i don't see that it tells anything about my, my future work. I mean, I could have stopped at that point and, and the discovery would be there. But if I am what I am in the sense that I have lived in science for 60 years and pursued science, that to me is far more important.